part two of the commentary on Thus Spake Zarathustra. The speeches of Zarathustra on the believers in the afterworld. Now, this is a really, it's kind of three uh, chapters in a row that are that are closely related in what Zarathustra or Nietzsche is, is thinking about here. Uh, the first one, the believers in the afterworld. Now, this is kind of a play on words in German, which is virtually untranslatable, but it's, it's kind of jokey and lots of wordplay in this section. But um, besides that, what he's really talking about here is a couple of related ideas. One, um, why do we believe in an afterworld, a heaven, all these sorts of invisible things that he calls, calls ghosts, this kind of madness of gods. And he says it's because we're suffering in the world and we think of the world as an imperfect, terrible place and we want to escape it. And crucially, Zarathustra actually says he used to be this way. I used to feel this way. I used to see the world as this imperfect, terrible place. And therefore, I needed to escape it. Where do you escape it to? Well, you escape it to this phantasmagorical other world. Um, and that is your that is your sort of gets you through the day is the belief in this other other place. But he says, no, all these gods, all these heavens are just, they're created by us for us. And th their madness is simply our madness. And he says the way that he escaped this is that he overcame himself as a sufferer. And this, the suffering thing will, will, will come up uh, several times. Um, here it seems to imply the notion that we want to escape the world because we see the world as a place of suffering and we feel we're suffering in it. So you can do a couple of things there. You can say, oh, there's this other world that I'm going to get to that's immaterial, that I can't feel, that I can't touch, and sort of it's a magic land that everything will be great. Or you can address your suffering here and, as Nietzsche says, overcome it. Not, not that he's saying he doesn't suffer. He just overcomes himself as a sufferer. He no longer sees his condition as being that of one who suffers. So this is a, a really important idea in Nietzsche, and it occurs in several of his books, but the idea that once you address suffering, recognize that, you know, people suffer, and that's true, but that doesn't define them and doesn't define you and shouldn't control what you do or don't do. Uh, similar to the section on sleeping, where it says our goal in life should not simply be a good night's sleep and that everything else is, is uh, sublimated to that so that, oh, if that was going to cause you to be restless or to think or to wonder or to ponder, you wouldn't do that because, well, that would interfere with your sleeping. Like suffering, you don't allow it to control your ambitions, your ideas, your ideals. You don't create gods in heaven so that you don't have to uh, deal with suffering anymore. Also, of course, Christ is the, is the big invocation of the sufferer itself. And so we want to take on, you know, it was considered godly to take on Christ's suffering. And then with that suffering, you sort of purified yourself so that you could go to another better world. And so the, the overcoming the suffering also means overcoming that sort of religious idea. What's, what, <clears throat> what's crucial about this, of course, is while in our own society we've turned down um, religion quite a bit, in Nietzsche's time this was a huge leap, like a massive <laughs> uh, 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 jump out of his cultural ideals, that you were supposed to at least pretend to be suffering and, and pretend to believe in this afterworld, even if you didn't really. It was the, it was the structure. However, we really do love the notion of suffering. We still, we still hang on to that with both hands. I mean, all the no pain, no gain sort of uh, macho nonsense that you hear, all these, you know, struggle and fight and bleed, and then you, then you achieve something, right? That you're this, this overcoming through suffering, that you have to embrace suffering and that life is about suffering and achievement is about suffering. You know, he's like, no, you overcome yourself as a sufferer, or at least this is according to Zarathustra, and that's the way you get rid of this whole uh, need for an other world or some perfect place or, or some gods or, or whatnot. Um, so this is ha half, I don't know, big part of what he's talking about here. The other part is when you're imagining another world, another place, a better place, you're ignoring yourself here now on the earth. And so once again, he invokes the earthly, the, the palpable, the physical. He says, look, the world is here. Embrace it here and now. You are here. Embrace yourself here and now. And again, this notion that the earth might be more important than heaven is really uh, radical in, in Nietzsche's time. 
because that was basically denying all the teachings of the church. I mean, it was okay to try to make the world okay, but you're really supposed to be focused on the next life, the next world, the heaven, as opposed to saying, no, my real world, my real life is here. This is the most important thing. We should focus on, uh, as he says, the earth, the earthly, our, our physical material incarnation here in this amazing world, that this is the heaven that we're aspiring to. And so that twin invocation of uh, don't look elsewhere and overcoming the notion of suffering as being good or necessary rather than as just something that is, but that one addresses but doesn't allow you to define you and certainly shouldn't be pursued as a goal. And it shouldn't also make you think, oh, well, this the whole world is just rotten. Let's just flee. Uh, will recur many times throughout Thus Spake Zarathustra. Similarly, the next section is, you know, closely related on the despisers of the body. To the despiser of the body will now say a word, not that I would have them learn of or teach differently, rather say farewell to their own bodies and thus become mute. It's a really damning opening to this section. He says, look, you say the body and bodily things are terrible, you know, sexual drive and physical pleasures and uh, eating and drinking. You say, oh, that's all terrible. It's all bad. It's all you know, awful. He says, great. Hey, you know, die and go away. If you don't like your body, leave it. That'll make, you know, he's, he's totally okay with that because he thinks these people are very irritating. Um, and if they really do despise their bodies, then they should just leave. Um, so this is part of it. And again, as with the previous section where he's saying this notion of escaping the world is wrong, this notion that our bodies are somehow sinful and dirty and uh, misleading and should the passion should be controlled. And he said, no, this, he said, this is wrong. Your body is wonderful. It's a source of knowledge. It is the eye that drives you. And, he, and, and so again, it's a twofold argument, at least twofold, but I think two important threads to pull out here is one, your body is basically good and your body controls a lot of what you think of as I, as yourself, as your mental capacities is actually just simply a manifestation of what your body wants in a sort of unthinking, unconscious way. Um, this is really for, you know, where he, when he was writing, then this is a huge leap forward. There's lots of research that's been shown that, yes, in fact, this is entirely accurate, that there our minds, our, our brains actually lie to us on, in, on behalf of the body. And mis, our brains mislead us in some ways because of what our body is, is, I mean, your body is not conscious, but your, your bodily processes control a lot more of what we're doing than we were aware. Um, Nietzsche says, this is just clear. He says, any you know, reflection on this will show that your desires for pain, your desires for, for pleasures, uh, to avoid pain, to embrace pleasures are driven not by your conscious control much of the time, but by your body. And so we should learn to embrace our bodies we should learn to love our bodies. We should learn to listen to our bodies and the wisdom that is inherent in our physical uh, self. And it's not that we should abandon our capacity to have thought and intellect, but what he's really arguing against is this notion of spirit, right? That again, if you think of your spirit goes to heaven, <clears throat> Nietzsche doesn't like this idea of spirit. He says, your spirit is just another aspect of the body. He's also arguing against this Cartesian dualism that says, oh, you have your mind as a sort of potentially perfect and embodied sphere, and it's, and it's captured in this sort of sorry body. Also, if you think of Pl Plato's uh, theory of the perfect forms, he's arguing against that as well, this notion of, oh, you know, your spirit will rise up, it gains knowledge of the perfect, which is this otherworldly realm, and then it comes back and is incarnated in these imperfect bodies that are misled by desires and pleasures. And if you've ever read... Uh, <clears throat> Plato, this 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 idea is, is throughout the uh, Platonic thought, and Nietzsche really dislikes it because he says, no, your body is here, your body is real, your body is good, and in any case, many of the things that we think we're thinking are really our bodies manifesting themselves in our thoughts. And so we need to come to embrace our bodies and love our bodies and understand them and listen to them rather than deny them and try to escape them. And this is a big, so when you combine these two sections together, what you have is a rejection of heaven on, in, in 
on the first section, and then you have this rejection of any sense of spirit as this otherworldly element that's more important than your body. And so he's rejecting basically all of Christian metaphysics and the entire Neoplatonist movement and pretty much all of Platonic thought in, in these two sections. Uh, what's important to note, of course, is he is living in a very religious time uh, when these sorts of Neoplatonic arguments and the questions of soul and spirit were really prominent. Again, in our own time, these have become less prominent, but even you'll hear this continuously where people say, oh, this is very spiritual or, you know, the spirit or something. I'm not religious, but I am a spiritual person. Um, it's, you know, there's a very vague notion and Nietzsche is suspicious, let us say at the least, uh, and to about what that might mean. And so he has Zarathustra art articulating very clearly that there is no spirit outside the body. What the body experiences is the body. You are not, there's not a higher force or a bigger calling. There's no other place to go. And so, A, the people who despise the body and preach the despising of the body, um, he's very happy for them to die and go away and leave their bodies, and hence they'll stop bothering us. Um, and B, that we need, rather than to think of escaping or outside of the body, we need to understand the wisdom of the body and embrace it. And again, even, um, you know, there's certainly much less than in Nietzsche's time, but we still really struggle with this notion of, of bodies and how to respond to them and, and think about and, and reflect upon what our bodies might have to teach us. Uh, if, if you've gone to college like I have for a long time and studied these things, for instance, the whole embrace, the, the physical aspect of the human being is almost never mentioned. You can read 10,000 pages of philosophy and you'd never know we had toes. But, it, it, but Nietzsche is saying, no, we need to move back and embrace that. And then the next section on the joy and suffering of the passions. Um, this again invokes a similar line. It says, my brothers, if you have a virtue and it is your virtue, then you share it with no one. The idea is your virtues should be your own. So once you've rejected the spirit and you've rejected the heaven, what's left? Your own virtue. And this virtue should come from your passions. That your passions, when you distill them and focus on them and develop them, will give you a sense of what really is your innate drive. Um, and once you have that, then you set that as your highest goal. And now you've overcome very much of what your society and your culture has been doing to limit you. Which is to say, oh, here's the virtues. The virtues are already listed. The virtues are already list listed on a table. And if you don't meet those virtues, you're a bad person. Nietzsche reverses that and he says, no, you look inside of yourself, you look in your body in this case, you feel your passions, you feel your desires, and you make those, you distill those into your virtues. In fact, mostly you distill that into your highest virtue. And then once you've done that, then you will love it and you will not want to vary from that. And so you'll create a value or a virtue for yourself to follow that you find highly motivating. And this will liberate you from all of these false teachings. And so in three sections, Nietzsche has attacked the whole notion of an afterlife, a heavenly world that causes a rejection of this physical world. The notion of suffering as central and important rather than something that should simply be overcome and become minor and in insufficient or in insufficient, in other words, not, not that important, insignificant, I guess, would be a better word. He's attacked the notion of a soul being separate from the body. He does not think that's an important concept, that it really is all about the body. Forget the soul and spirit and all these ghosts that people dream up. And now he basically says the entire moral value, virtue system of your society, you need to rethink that. And you need to rethink that from within your own passions and your desires. Because once you've gotten rid of those external forces, where else can you look? for what a virtue is, for what is virtuous, rather than into yourself. And of course, you'll immediately run into these arguments today, and even much more in a case when Nietzsche's time, that, oh, well, if you just allow people to run wild with their passions, well then, 
you know, they'll just go around and kill people or, you know, it's, it's bad things. Civilization will collapse. We have to have these external rules. And Nietzsche says, no, if we honestly look into ourselves and examine ourselves, he thinks, no, 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 this will be liberating and we can create our own individual virtues. And it's always hard to know, you know, for, for, for Nietzsche and, of course, here for Zarathustra, right, how many people can really achieve that. Nietzsche is always suspicious about how many people can achieve that, but he still thinks it's the right thing to strive for. So three chapters, and he's completely uh, and, and quickly overthrown, you know, the pillars of his culture and to a certain degree the pillar of our cultures because we still don't trust people's bodies. We still think they need to be disciplined. We still, uh, we still, I tend to think, I think suffering is more real than, than joy or pleasure. And so his rejection of these kinds of norms, these, his, re, his rejection of these systems and, and to invoke rather a reliance on ourselves, on the earth, on our bodies and on our passions to create new, that really is something that's quite different. And I think this is one of the things that makes it difficult to read these sections, which are, they read very clearly. To me, once you've embraced the sort of radical rewriting of the underpinnings of our entire value system, that's the problem. This is why I mentioned he's clear, but what he's clear about is really pretty powerfully removed from our normal social assumptions. On the Pale Criminal. This is one section that I found very confusing, and I still think it's somewhat confusing. However, I have some suggestions for what might be going on here, but I don't want to claim, you know, uh, that it's not a confusing passage because there is definitely some questions. Um, but it opens with what I think is the key to it: is you will not kill, O judges and sacrificers, until the beast has nodded. Behold, the pale criminal has nodded. From out of his eyes speaks the great despising. The idea here is that the criminal, the, the person who's been found guilty, they don't want to kill you. They don't want to kill the criminal until you've admitted your guilt. And this is what kind of drives Zarathustra mad or drives Nietzsche mad, is that we're in a system where external values have been forced upon us. And then we live with those values and we're judged by those values, even though they may have little or nothing to do with us. And that kind of drives us mad. What is man? a ball of wild snakes which rarely enjoys a respite from each other. So they go forth and they seek prey in the world. So we're this, this sort of ball of writhing snakes, what a great image, that, you know, competing ideas, competing values. And we look out in the world and we see hypocrisy and we see injustice. And this makes us angry and we think, oh, we want to lash out. But we want to lash out in the ways that are within the context of that very system. And so what we see as injustice is the justice that we've been trained to expect not in, not being met. And therefore, we're angry, but we're angry within the context of a system that is itself creating the problem, if that makes sense. So, for example, in another lecture, I talked about that the Walton family, the founders of Walmart, they're, you know, respected people. They're on the cover of magazines, they're interviewed, they, you know, have gala dinners at museums, et cetera, et cetera. They've been found guilty of uh, wage theft in the billions and billions of dollars. They've been found guilty of this repeatedly. It's not, not once or twice. It's, it's happened many times for billions of dollars, but somehow they're not criminals. However, if I, if, if I go to uh, Walmart and I steal a TV, Ah, uh, I, I would be a criminal. Now, if I'm an angry person, I'm like, oh, look at these rich people. They're just stealing money. I'm going to strike back at them. What do I think of doing to strike back at them? The very idea within the system of justice is, oh, I'll go steal a TV from Walmart and I'll feel sort of justified in that, even though I also know that's wrong because I'm in this dynamic. The, the very notion that I think of it as hip hypocritical um, means that I'm, that I'm judging within the system. And that my notion of judge, judgment and right and wrong, good and evil, beyond good and evil, is coming from this outside system. And that is, in fact, driving me mad. And that so when the criminal goes before the judges, what we really want is for the criminal and the judges to agree. Because then that uh, underwrites the whole system. Okay, yes, you committed the crime, but you agree that you committed the crime. So now we know everything is okay. 
now that we can all agree on how the world works and we can move on. Nietzsche, however, wants this not to happen. He wants there to be a different sort of judgment. And he, and he argues here in this passage, or he says in the passage, enemy you shall say, but not evil doer. Sick man you shall say, not scoundrel. Fool you shall say, but not sinner. And each of these, the distinction is, it's not uh, inherent in the man. So you can be my enemy, but I can choose you, or you can create, make yourself my enemy, that, but not evildoer. The evil is the judgment from the outside. The enemy is the idea between us. We create that. Sick man, uh, not scoundrel. If you're a scoundrel, that's inherent to you. If you're sick, that's something else. Fool, someone who doesn't know what they're doing or doesn't have understanding, but not sinner. Again, we have a list of right and wrong. We have a list of sins, and your sin is innate in you. In fact, in theory, can only be forgiven by a God. <clears throat> and so... Each of these distinctions is roughly the same. We want to take it out of the inherent nature of the person and and create a new way of thinking about what's right and wrong. Well, beyond good and evil, of course, is a work that's coming. So <clears throat> Nietzsche's trying to, like in the earlier works where he's trying to liberate our bodies and liberate us for the earth and forget all these other earthly systems and heavens and all that. He's, here he's trying to do the same thing with justice. How does the individual liberate themselves from, move from these systems of, of justice and morality that are embedded in us that, in this case, he argues, um, also sort of produce some crime. They actually make crime happen because of the, the reciprocal nature of, of judging and internalizing and then feeling the wrong and then wanting to lash out with the very thing that you've internalized as wrong. And so now we both recognize that it's wrong. And that cycle, uh, Nietzsche feels, is terrible because it has nothing to do with the individual. And again, over and over again, he's trying to eliminate, uh, liberate the individual from these larger cultural systems. On reading and writing. Well, another great section here. Of all that is written, I only love that which has been written with one's own blood. Write with blood and you will find that blood is spirit. So write so that it really, really matters. One's own blood, by the way, again, similar to the pale criminal, writing what is yours, writing what really comes from you. Unfortunately, as Zarathustra remarks here, this makes it difficult to read, and particularly when you write in aphorisms, as Nietzsche tends to do. But he says here, I hate lazy readers. Right? I don't um, I, I, even if I, it makes it more difficult, I don't care because I don't write for people who are just lazy. And I think this is important. I think, you know, lazy, definitely a judgment here to say, if you're not going to bother to really read, why would you expect um, to encounter anything that, you know, shakes you? Because simple things are things that are easy to understand. Again, back to why I wanted to do this commentary on Zarathustra is because the challenge is because it's writing against our thinking. And, and so it makes it very difficult and you have to stop and go slow or it becomes incomprehensible, and which is exactly what Nietzsche sort of had in mind. So it's, it's sort of not even a criticism of his work in a way because he, he's invoking it uh, perhaps defensively, but he's invoking it as um, a goal. This is how he wants to la write. Another aspect of this, which I think is important both for this section and many of the sections here, is uh, who amongst you can laugh and be uplifted at the same time? Now, this is a, really a great image, right? We always think of, again, back to the passion and the suffering and, you know, violence and people rising up and, oh, you know, you rise up with all this. So Nietzsche says laughter. Let's do it with laughter. Not with wrath does one kill, but with laughter. Come, let us kill the spirit of heaviness. And so part of what he's talking about in writing uh, and producing is he says, you know, let's get rid of this, the, the, the heaviness. Let's get rid of all this suffering and all, you know, this, oh, we've got to be serious. And can't we laugh? And then one last passage where he mentions life is difficult to bear. But why else would you have the pride in the morning and the rest in the evening? Life is hard to bear. But don't be so sensitive. We are all pretty sturdy asses and she asses, right? It's not that hard. We're pretty good. We can do this. Let's laugh. 
let's shake off these uh, this sort of press of the world that says, oh, you've got to be grinding, you've got to have that uh, pain, you've got to be really striving if you're going to be uplifted, you know, you've got to climb that mountain, right? It's always that image of climbing that mountain, you know, really struggling up rather than, wow, isn't it great to be in the mountains? Isn't it beautiful? Isn't the air fresh and the flowers lovely and the streams are running? Or you can invoke the Taoist model and say, no, water only flows downhill. You should never climb a mountain, right? Because it's hard. Only do easy things. That, but that notion of saying, hey, just get rid of all this heaviness. Let's get rid of all this judgment. Let's, let's laugh. Let's have some joy. And let's see if we can't raise ourselves up with laughter and joy and beauty as really this uh, interesting, it's a big move in this very short passage from, hey, write with blood, write with yours, write what's powerful, write what's going to last, but also let's laugh. Let's also be uplifted with laughter and let's kill that heavy stuff. And one, one can think here of the very weighted philosophical tomes and the tone of them, which is one reason I think Zarathustra, the, the, the series is so great, is because this, the tone is so refreshingly different from all the weightiness, all the heaviness, all the just, you know, plodding, serious, rational discourse, page after page after page, as if one can't make a joke, as if that would somehow disqualify the entire philosophical work of a, of a writer like Heidegger or Schopenhauer, you know, that, that's just not allowed. And even when it does occur in some of these works, um, it's, it's very rare, and we tend to sort of blot them out like, oh, the writer there had just gone a little crazy, and we'll just pretend like that doesn't exist, and we'll edit it out in the books that we give college students because it's not an important passage. But Nietzsche is like, no, write with blood, but laugh. Write what's yours, but be uplifted, and don't be heavy. So these whole these four sections sort of, Again, it's not one sustained argument, but he is pressing on on a similar issue in all of these, which is how does the individual respond to reading and writing in a world where so much what have written, what is written and read is is worthless? And uh, thinking about the body and thinking how does the individual respond to and engage with this world? And I think one of the great suggestions is we should laugh about it. <laughs> 